Good morning. Welcome. We're going to start by acknowledging um, the land. We acknowledge the land we are meeting on is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabek, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. We acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. The City of Toronto reports that agencies serving the Indigenous community in Toronto estimate that there are 70,000 residents from this community. Toronto has the largest Indigenous population in Ontario and the fourth largest in Canada. This land acknowledgement reminds us that we benefit from living and working on this land that is the traditional territory of Indigenous peoples. We are accountable to these relationships and we are grateful for access to the space and place in which we assemble today. Good morning. Welcome to the Micro Certification Forum 2020, hosted by eCampus Ontario. My name is Jamie Robinson. This is the third year we are hosting this event. This year is the largest, and I am confident that it will be even better than the previous. We are joined today by representatives from 35 of our member colleges and universities, the Ministry of Labor, the Ministry of Colleges and Universities, and more than 60 private sector and nonprofit organizations. In addition to those of you who are, who are here with us in person, I'm pleased to welcome more than 100 other participants who are live streaming this event. Thank you all for coming. Let's get started. Lena. So thank you all so much for coming. This is so wonderful to see all of your faces here um, in this beautiful space, um, which we are really grateful to be able to have access to. So when we look forward into the future of our learning, training, and skills recognition systems, what do we see? And more importantly, I always think, what do we hope for? At eCampus Ontario, we think this is the shape of the future. This is the T-shaped graduate, and we use this image all the time when we're having these kinds of conversations. This is a student who has acquired deep domain knowledge in her discipline through a degree, a diploma, or a certificate. She has a strong understanding of the history of scholarship that preceded her and how her discipline is evolving today. She knows where the gaps are in the research and how further inquiry might fill them. But she also has a really unique set of cross-domain skills and attitudes that are going to differentiate her when she goes for her first job interview. Both the horizontal and the vertical planes are critical to the future of work. So if we know that this might be an end goal that we want to see, how do we get there? We start by learning as a community how to recognize the signals of change and to become open and responsive to new perspectives and new solutions that might address them. And we know these challenges are not solved by a single sector, a single organization, a single institution. The, the issues are far too complex and they change too quickly for those kinds of strategies to ever work. So instead, we think it's the collective intelligence of a network shared openly and with good intention that will allow our systems of learning recognition to grow and evolve alongside the economic and social changes that we see happening every day. So please consider this event one of many entry points into the conversation about skills recognition and the future of work you've got an incredible array of opportunities to engage in these conversations coming at you from all over the place, and we encourage you to dive in to all of them. Do your best at this event to have a conversation with someone from an organization that you have never heard of. Ask them how they see the issue, and ask them what they think might be the best way forward. 
This event is designed with diverse perspectives in mind. The first half of the day is all about big picture thinking, and we have three keynotes for you from three different corners of the landscape to help provoke some interesting questions about where we go next. The afternoon is your chance to see what microcertification looks like in practice. We have 14 institutions and industry partners ready here to deliver presentations about their microcertification pilot activities that have been taking place over the last couple of months. And those presentations will happen in this space and they will also happen in the room down the hall. All of these pilot projects have been using the eCampus Ontario microcertification principles and framework as a starting point for their work. You can find these principles and framework documents on your tables, on all the tables and all the rooms, and also at our booth there. And if you're interested in adopting these principles for your next microcertification project, we set up an adoption form on our website, and that link will also be shared with you in a follow-up email after the event. So check it out, have a think about it, and see whether it might be helpful for you. Before Jamie introduces our next keynote, our first keynote, we have three. I have two things I wanna keep you in mind. Jamie mentioned we have hundreds of people joining us virtually, and so there are two things I need you to do. If you are active on Twitter, I want you to join them in the online conversation that I hope they're having um, using the hashtag microcert2020, and that's the eCampus Ontario handle in there as well. And when, our key, and when our keynotes go to Q&A, we need you to use the microphone. And this is really important for two reasons. First, accessibility. Second, we have hundreds of people on the live stream that are not gonna hear your question if you don't use the microphone. So we have wonderful mic runners from eCampus Ontario on either side of the room who will be at your side if you have you know, a sudden moment of inspiration. So now over to Jamie to introduce our first keynote. Thank you. Our first keynote speaker is Kathleen Delasky. Kathleen is from Washington, D.C., where she is president of the Education Design Lab, an organization she founded after eight years on the board of George Mason University. A social entrepreneur, Kathleen has extensive experience in nonprofit leadership. She's been involved in launching organizations that focus on improving the quality of education for non-elite students for more than 20 years. The Education Design Lab has supported some 60 universities to identify education models that improve ed opportunities for underserved learners. Please join me in welcoming Kathleen. I just want to get familiar with the clicker. Thank you so much for having me. I was uh, very excited to come to Toronto. I live in Washington, D.C., uh, where the lab is based. Uh, we work around the world, but uh, I, I was excited to come to Toronto because you all really have, I think I was thinking about it this morning as I was meeting people from all walks here, you have a very unique collaborative uh, that is um, really focused around how to think about the T-shaped graduate for the future. I don't see collaboratives like this in our travels around, around the world. Um, in the States, for example, there are not, um, there, there, there is not, there are not collections where employers are at the table and, uh, and um, colleges and government uh, are at the table. It just doesn't exist. We're trying to get there uh, in, in support of our, uh, of the, uh, of the cause. But uh, we really, um, we're not there yet in many places, so it's very excited. You all really are in in a, in the driver's seat to show us what can what can be possible. Let's see if I is that. Uh, so let me start out by painting a little picture of the future because we part of our role at the lab is to help people look around the corner at what's coming and how to think about that on behalf of. Of, of what we call new majority learners, so the kind of learners that are not uh, getting uh, getting all of the advantages of, of technology and learning science and uh, and uh, 
uh, the, the new economy, uh, the creative economy that uh, has created so many opportunities. So imagine a world without resumes. You know, we're all very comfortable with resumes. Uh, yes, we're putting, starting to put resumes online, but if you think about the kinds of collections of things that are on a resume, you know, ranging from your, your grade point average to your major, to your, uh, to your list of activities, those things employers are increasingly telling us are not, uh, are not cutting it to help them either differentiate uh, uh, candidates or, or, um, or sort through all, all of the factors that they need to sort through these days. Um, think about a world that was Stephanie's resume. Think about a world where Stephanie now has to impress anonymous search filters to get to the interview stage. In our work with employers, they are telling us that the pain point for hiring now is that they're getting, you know, because of e-applications and your, your ability to click on LinkedIn or anywhere to, 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 to apply for a job, they're just being inundated with resumes and they are not able to uh, use, uh, use uh, a human touch to sort through them. So they're having to make decisions based on anonymous search filters. And, and as you know, it's moving even to a different stage soon. We, we could debate how soon, but we'll move to a different stage where, where we'll be using AI. But for now and for the foreseeable future, it's really search filters. So how do we help Stephanie make sure that she is digitally visible? I mean, obviously, make sure my clicker is. Obviously, you all are very well aware of badging. So, Stephanie can have a collaboration badge uh, that helps demonstrate some of the things that used to be on her activities list or that she learned in courses. And I don't know if you can see the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the specific uh, pieces on here, but can we, can we convert uh, Stephanie's resume into searchable terms uh, that begin to make her much more visible to employers, not just at the level of the word collaboration, but all the way down to the specifics of what are the subcompetencies, what does that mean? Uh, that's, you know, that begins to give Stephanie a lot more visibility as she uh, goes into the hiring market for the skills that she may not even know she needs. And you know, we see that as you know, part of the role of higher education to begin to help make her visible. We also see the collection of those micro-credentials or micro-certifications, because they don't have to be badges as long as they're visible digitally. Um, we see a, a lot of um, interest and, and we're seeing early success in what we're calling micro-pathways. Uh, and, and a lot of work is starting to happen to get people to think about how to put collections of micro-certifications together to help people get to that next level of, of job. If we can look at the skills they have, how do we get them to the next level? So this is actually a picture of a group that we're working with. We're working with Goodwill San in San Antonio, Texas. Um, uh, Walmart is funding this project, and we're actually able to take certifications for logistics. So you know, there's concern about automation. We're taking uh, certifications for logistics and coupling them with 21st century skill badges uh, and, uh, and, and helping uh, design pathways that uh, workers can do on, on the job. So they're given like half a day a week to, to work on these skills. And, and we're seeing really early uh, success results. And so a lot of the work then is how do you make these micro pathways visible to employers, the ones that, you know, that work and that correspond to what the data is telling us the high skill needs are in regions. How do we put all that together? Uh, we, we, th we see this as the work, uh, some of the work ahead of us. Um, employers are warming up to micro-credentials, uh, and we'll hear from um, IBM uh, next, and, and you can hear more about that, but we see, uh, this is a study from a year ago uh, that was I think, mostly US, US uh, uh, employers, but they are beginning to see the, the value for two things, really. Uh, one is um, an, an ability to come more quickly to, um, to finding a bigger hiring pool around very specific things, um, but they're also, they're also pretty desperate to find both the human skills uh, that go with the technical skills that they, you know, that they already sort of know how to, how to track and how to, they know how to ask for those, but it's the more intangibles that have been 
that have been difficult. Um, th this uh, this uh, should uh, hopefully uh, give you a little sense. Uh, this is from a survey that we did of uh, some 30 employer partners that we're working with in, in one project called Badge to Hire, uh, where uh, they they really uh, those employers think that that um, these these micro certifications and micro credentials will become as important as as degree uh, as soon as we can figure out how to make them rigorous and um, also um, uh, you know visible to employers because that's been an issue as well and and. You know, interestingly, there were no employers who didn't want to explore uh, new new approaches for hiring uh, for as for hiring tools. Um, this is an example of a of a uh, of a quote from uh, from one of the employers who who really feels uh, this is we're working in Maine with the state of Maine, and uh, you know this employer felt that potential applicants um, this really will help differentiate. They're doing they're working on badging with us and. In fact, this, the, the, the University of Maine system is adopting uh, the badging framework that we've come up with that I'll say a, a bit more about in a minute. So the, the point here is that colleges and universities really have to unlock degrees. Um, and I, I don't, that's not gonna come as a surprise to anyone in this room probably, but the, there, there are many ways to do that and I'm gonna spend a, 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 a chunk of this talk actually giving some suggestions on that, but it is, it is, it has been a wake-up call, really, and I think even in the last year, we are hearing more and more of colleges and universities coming to the table to say, okay, yes, we, we have to break down our degrees into micro-pathways and individual certifications and still offer degrees, but in stackable fashion. And, and I'd be interested in the Q&A to hear whether you're seeing that, too. Um, so just a, a word about the lab. Uh, we, we've worked with 125 institutions around the country. I'm sorry, around, the, around we started out US-based, but have, you know, doing a fair amount of work in Africa now and some in uh, Southeast Asia. We really see three, uh, what we call design criteria, because we use uh, design, design thinking in our work. Um, affordability, portability, and relevance. And you know, five, six years ago when we, when we named these three as sort of paramount in our design work, it seemed, you know, at the time, people were sort of like, why those? Um, but increasingly, that's where the market demand has gone. And uh, I'm, I'm sure you're seeing that too. We, um, we try to get the folks that we work with to think about putting the learner first, and that again is no, is no is, is something that you're probably doing and have been doing. But it's really interesting when you try to break down the silos and, and think about how, if, if higher education was not designed for the, the, the learner groups that are on this uh, slide, how, you know, if you really looked at it through that lens, how would you design differently? So we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, but we, we think it's really a time of, of great disruption. Um, I started the lab because we, we all saw this disruption coming in the form of startups trying to figure out who's going to be the Uber of higher education, you know, who's going to get there first to, uh, to, try, to, um, to uh, try to just, you know, offer you uh, Amazon-style uh, courses in a box. You know, there was an article mentioned in the New York Times yesterday about subscription models for education where, you, you know, you pay $99 a month and you just get your you know, micro creds and you do it however you want. This, is, this was the vision that started formulating, uh, you know, 12, no, sorry, in 2012, 13, as MOOCs were coming out, right? But now, um, employers are coming to the table uh, for, for a variety of reasons, and it, there's, a lot of, um, there's a lot of possibility to, to really pilot, so we try to pilot things to really show proof points. And we call this time the learner revolution because we see if we get it right, learners will be empowered, all kinds of learners will be empowered. If we get it wrong, we're gonna harden the lines uh, that, are, you know, that are already demonstrating the possibility of dire consequences societally and economically. So th this, uh, this slide shows the, um, this is a, a study from uh, Strata's Institute of uh, Future of Work, which really plays on uh, Lena's slide for the T-shaped individual. So what, what the data is suggesting is that you will have, over the course of your career, 
you know, eight or nine jobs. Um, but you can see the T's here, right? Maybe they look more like icicles, but uh, they, th these are, th this is the notion that you'll always need the universal skills, but the technical skills that, uh, that, uh, that come down from here will change over the course of your life. So you need, we need ways as higher education to be able to help people reskill and upskill on the technical loops and always get, I'm sorry, on the technical uh, stems, but always get better on what we call the universal or the power or the human skills. So that's um, you know, something to think about. We imagine a world, and we wrote a, a white paper about this uh, a year ago, uh, about the learner revolution, where, where colleges and uh, you know, financial aid resources will be approving competencies. So we'll move to a competencies, not degrees world, um, where you may be able to earn different kinds of competencies to get to the point that you want to, uh, that have nothing to do with a major or a degree or a course. And that um, we're also seeing some really interesting data mining going on that's helping us get to a precision skill level. The data is getting better. So this, this slide is, is also from a, a Strata's Institute of Work um, a new report that came out that I recommend to you all if you haven't seen it. It's called the, Geo the New Geography of Skills that looks at what they call skill shapes regionally. So this, this suggests that in three different cities, the needs for manufacturing uh, and, per, and uh, advanced manufacturing might be very different in terms of the specific skill sets that are needed from one city to the next or one region to the next. And there are these data companies like MZ and Burning Glass that are, you know, that are, that are helping communities uh, figure out what, are our, what do our skill shapes look like as a region and how do we need to show opportunity. We're also doing work with the Federal Reserve Banks across the US um, that are helping uh, identify what are called opportunity occupations, where you might just need one or two skills to get to a middle wage and they're a middle wage salary. So we're identifying, well, which are those? And how do we get the word out to the university and college community? How do we help them create the micro pathways to get there? So that's, that's one of the interesting places that the, that, the, that the work is heading. So I wanted to give you four, what I see from the higher ed standpoint, you're gonna hear from other perspectives, but from the perspective of where, from where you sit, if, if you're higher ed, higher education um, providers, what are, what are your four imperatives for what we call the learner revolution? So I list them all here, and then I wanna make sure that um, we can get through them, because um, I'm gonna take each, each uh, through in turn. So the first one is really to recognize that 95% of learning happens outside the classroom, and that beyond the classroom to capture, assess, and credential that learning. Um, and to make it machine readable to the point we made earlier. That is, you know, probably job one. Um, we, the, the, the Education Design Lab, we work across many areas, but the area where we've had the most, I guess, uh, you know, where we've really kind of turned into a product laboratory is around 21st century skills. So we have launched actually a first an OER toolkit um, of, of these 21st century skills. Um, they're badges, um, people are offering them for like a credit or two credits sometimes. And what we've, what we've learned in, in doing that work is that really when you're asking uh, a learner to, to have an experiential learning experience and to um, get to know or, or become skilled in a 21st century skill, that, that this is sort of our formula for the badges that we've created, and I know a lot of you have your own formulas, but it's been successful for us to think about it as a continuum of, you know, learn the skill, practice and reflect on the skill, and then be assessed by it. And you can even do that at the sub-competency level and then build up to a badge on the thing. So here's our version of the T, the T-shaped, uh, uh, we're, we're sort of filling it with data. So I don't know if you can see this from where you're sitting, but I do have one, um, I have one insert here to show. So each of those boxes across the top of the T have a 21st century skill, and then we have four sub-competencies that we've worked with 60, uh, probably at this point, 60 universities and about 60 employers to basically you know, sit in rooms and cross-reference and get to an agreement on, okay, what, 
What is it about critical thinking that matters to an employer who's hiring a learner? Um, and, how to, and, what, and what do you need to see to buy into that? And so these are, this is for critical thinking, um, uh, the four, the four sub-competencies. And, and you, you could you know, think about your courses that you're teaching to some extent, and you know, the, these can be pulled out of your courses, um, and we'll talk about that in a second. Uh, another example, if you know Northeastern University, which is probably the best known stateside university for experiential learning, they have a co-op model where you, you know, come in and out of school and work. Um, they have something called the SAIL, which is basically a mobile app, which I think you're going to see more of over the, over the coming uh, you know, months and, and, and few years. It's, um, it's self-authored uh, informal learning is what SAIL stands for, and so you basically use an app to capture your learning as you go, and so they're having, they, they say they're having some success with that. I think a lot of other, you know, startups and entrepreneurs are thinking about how do we help you in a handheld way capture that learning while students are, uh, you know, are either at work or other, other places. So secondly, it's be the curator, sense maker, and advisor of learning opportunities wherever they occur. I mean, here we argue we cannot keep up. If the, if the half-life of a skill is now five years, you cannot create a department with PhD uh, uh, professors to keep up with this pace. So just like be okay with that, own it, and why can't we be the curators and sense makers of other people's stuff? Um, that's part of what OER is about, obviously, but then you know how you manage that and own it and see the opportunity uh, and what is, you know, in effect, the business opportunity for the college is, is a good question. So this is the number, 738,000, that Credential Engine, uh, which is a, a, an organization that um, tracks credentials and the production of credentials, this is an organization, uh, they, they have named that there are 738,000 discrete credentials now, and that number doubled from one year ago. So... And this is what your learners are getting bombarded with from other sources now, you know, like edX and Coursera and you know, this certification over here and over there. And now companies are starting, you know, they're, they're working in a company and they're, they're being told, oh, get this, get this badge, get that badge. So what is, is, is your role not to be the sense maker, the advisor, the trusted advisor, um, and the um, potentially certifier of combinations of what is going to come at your learners anyway. Um, we, you know, we, with our badges, we have three models where you can become the curator, uh, you know, standalone, course integrated, or creating learning communities around our badges, and that's been very successful. We have 25 pilots going on right now. Course integrated is probably the favorite, and I can talk to you more about that after, I'll be around this morning, I can talk to you more about that. But we, you know, we really see that the construct has to change. You know, a few years ago, um, uh, uh, the Stanford did a, an interesting thing where they said, you know, you, ha you, can't, you have to start thinking about the university as the loop um, throughout your life of where people can circle back and get bits of learning. Well, we think if, we, we want to update that model and say, think about it more as the weave. And the re one reason is to recognize that 70% of learners, and this is a stateside statistic, I'm not sure what it is here, but it may not be that different, have to work at least half time to pay for school. Um, so how can we better make that a feature of the learning? And I think you've got some pilots going on related to that, but we're not doing a great job stateside on this. And, and we're, we're, you know, the lab is trying to catalyze some of these, some of these models to work with employers to to really turn you know, re retail jobs into credentialing opportunities um, or those side jobs that, that particularly underserved learners can't do the cool re internships um, and how can we help make their learning count. And so the other thing that we're doing is helping overlay these micro pathways onto both um, um, high school, you know, uh, dual enrollment where you know, you're taking college courses while you're in high school to help overlay micro pathways that help people get a job. This is a pathway for like phlebotomy, you know, who knew that in this city that we're working in, in Virginia, uh, phlebotomy was a need that the city had in, in the healthcare industry and they could earn a, pr a pretty good salary. Um, so can't 
people going to school be phlebotomists and let's work the school around them while they're on the path to being a nurse or something else. So, you know, this is not rocket science, and, but it is, you know, you have to actually put it together and then make it visible to learners. So that's a key, a key segue here because number four, my last category, is help your learners be digitally visible to employers. Um, so if they're earning that pathway I just showed you, how can they, how can they um, have that in a, in a digital format that another employer or their employer could see, you know, so that they might be able to, so that they don't have to have all the networks? Because this, this piece really gets at, you know, what for us is so, so, um, such a strong, uh, you know, equity piece. 43% of college students are underemployed when they graduate. And the leading thing driving that is that those are the people that couldn't have the cool internships and don't have the work experience. They're not digitally visible. They don't have the networks. We feel like this new movement around a skills-based economy and skills-based capturing of learning can really help those people um, become, become visible. And you know, I think we have actually, I've written a piece about this, we, we have a, a kind of a moral responsibility to do that. So you know, th this is a, a, actually an IBM badge, you're gonna hear from IBM. Um, they have their, and I'll just give a little endorsement uh, uh, before Carrie comes up. Um, they are really leading the way for showing employees how they can upskill and what it takes for them to upskill, like a visibility for advancement in their, in their company, and um, you know what? What if what if we could all do that with the the world around learners while they're in school? There's you know there's a there's a entry level version of that that could be really powerful. And you know I, I, I encourage you to to help do that. And 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 for one reason, not just because it helps them be employable, but what we've seen. This is a survey we took of a couple, you know, about 100 um, badge earners uh, for um, a couple of the badges uh, among university students. And, you know, I, I won't go through these statistics, uh, but they are, they're really, you know, we originally were doing this work to try to help uh, people become employed, but what we didn't realize is the confidence it would build for the learners themselves and for the, um, uh, their ability to articulate and translate the skills uh, when they got into the workplace. So, you know, coming back to um, the resume, I, I just would like to do a survey here. How, about how many years you think it will take till, uh, till we're at the point that, um, that our, our learners are digitally visible, um, where, where resumes will be, in effect, a backpack, a collection of of um, digitally visible certifications. You know, degrees might be in there, but they would be just one thing among others. So let me ask, uh, how many think that we will be there in three years? We have, uh, we have five optimistic people. <laughs> how many of you think we'll be there in five years? Okay, well, that's about a third of the room. So seven years? Okay, and 10 years? Okay, all right, well in the q and I would love to hear about um, what, uh, what you think is holding, you know, what, what some of the barriers to making that happen will be. And my last slide, I just want to um, tell you that we, we are launching a platform that we were so inspired by this notion of visible learning that we, um, we we're, launching a platform in May to help make learning visible, starting with the 21st century skills. We'll be adding in micro pathways. But you know, one of the issues is expecting each group around the world oops, to have to reinvent the wheel if we can publish and uh, provide scale and training to make these things happen. That's a big piece of our theory of change. So with that, I would like to uh, move to questions. Okay, we have one back here. And um, please wait for the mic. Earlier you said that you mentioned the word curator. I wanted to know who the curator is. 
That's a great, that's a great question. Um, we actually have done some uh, piloting and modeling work on what is the faculty's role in the future of higher education in, in, in this world. And then, and the, you know, as we did various uh, prototyping, the, the, the word that comes up the most is curator, um, you know, more than teacher. Um, a curator, so, so I think my number one answer of who is faculty. And I know that might, that might sound difficult uh, because that's not, that's not the construct or the way that you prepare yourself. Just like we were saying yesterday, I was at a session with some of you that that faculty, you get your PhD, and you're not necessarily even prepared to teach, um, let alone curate what is going on in the rest of the world in the area and how to how to mold that in. You, it sounds like you want to follow up. I just wanted to add, but in my perspective, I would think the person, the student, they're the curator, and they have to learn how to curate. But that's just how I think about it. I think you're absolutely right, but how many learners do we know who have access or knowledge to what is going on? I mean, I, I am so influenced by what happened in the 90s and 2000s in higher ed, at least in the US, where the marketing that went on for private colleges on television and the colleges and the opportunities, the curated opportunities that the students all knew about were the people who had the biggest marketing budgets not the things that were the best for them, you know, not the programs that were actually gonna be best for them. So yes, learners can be their own curators, and you know, today's Googling capabilities uh, offer us a lot more ability to be a, um, you know, a wise consumer, but faculty, faculty could play such a role, there's still such a need for someone, for there to be a cohort, and for someone to be the leader of that cohort, to, to do that learning, to do that sense making. And I don't think, you know, all, all of the research shows that that is still the best way, and it can be online learning, right? But that you, you, need, uh, you need someone to advise you um, rather than, I mean, if you imagine that Stephanie is just figuring it all out herself, I worry about that for the 50 to 60% of people who don't have the networks and the, and the um, you know, the, the background of, 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 of knowledge and, um, uh, well, network really to to make that happen. Uh, one more question. Sorry if, to go on on that one. But, oh, this is a good, very good question. Uh, in the back here. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much for your talk, Kathleen. As you're talking, I'm I'm becoming really concerned about the focus on employment as the only goal for post-secondary and for learning, and this merging of post-secondary and employers. It's, it takes away many of the things that I think are really human about us and about learning. I want poetry, I want music, I want other things in my education. I wanna be a good citizen. I wanna support my learners to do that, and I'm not seeing that here. I'm seeing it down, reduced down to what is your digital skill set? How quickly can I eliminate you from my employee pool based on the digital skills I see you do or do not have? So I'm really worried about yep. the kind of human element of that. So how, how is that coming up, especially when you're working with learners who want, who want to learn things that are not necessarily tied to being a worker bot for a huge employer that's making billions of dollars. I have to pay for my post-secondary education out of my pocket as a worker, uh, and somebody is benefiting from that. So how, how yeah. are your learners expressing those kinds of ideas? Well, that, that's a great question. I think you're very right to worry about this. As we unbundle and modularize skill building, it, you know, learning could become a vocational exercise. And you know, part of our goal of keeping these 21st century skill learning, I mean, that is more sort of a, an effort to keep liberal arts in the mix. Um, that, that's, you know, so that's one answer to the question is we have to, you know, I always say make room for Shakespeare. I was an English major uh, in these vocational pathways. But people, a lot of learners are going to go there out of necessity, at least in terms of cost and relevance and portability and you know, their ability to 
get, get where they need to go. And so I think we have a responsibility to keep, to keep um, the, the broader uh, learning experiences, all the, the things that we love about higher education in, in the mix. I think it's going to be hard. It's going to be, a, there's going to be a tension. And that's one reason I answered the question about who's the curator. You know, th that is a faculty's role. We have to keep the traditional university experience in the mix. And I think it is going to be hard to do. But um, and I hate to end on a on a negative note, but uh, it it it's a tension we need to be aware of, and that we need to fight against. And I think affordability is the best way to fight against that. Thank, thank you. Wait, 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 wait. I just want to thank Kathleen so much for coming all the way from Washington to be with us today. Thank you thank so you. much, thank Kathleen. You. Thanks for all the good questions. These are all really important pieces of the conversation that we need to get out, so keep asking them, please. Okay, next we are so pleased to welcome Carrie Moreno. Carrie is a client manager at IBM, supporting partnerships in education and research. Carrie does an incredible job of connecting the dots between IBM Canada and a number of post-secondary institutions that she works with across the country. And every time I talk to Carrie, I'm really struck by how how authentically she builds these relationships with faculty, with deans, with students, with researchers, always finding new ways to leverage the technology that she has and that her company has to foster innovative connections between her industry and the education system that feeds it. So Carrie, please come up and uh, get us started. I wish my children could have heard that. <laughs> um, so thank you very much, Lena, for the warm introduction. It's a pleasure to be here today with all of you that uh, I know Kathleen alluded to, this collaboration with academia, industry, and community. It's such a rich opportunity for those of us to work in this space and really collaborate together. It's also a, an honor to be here on behalf of IBM, um, a hundred-year-old company that I think um, is recognized as uh, an innovator and a leader um, and uh, some good business sense to stay in business for under, or, you know, over a, a hundred years. Um, it, it was a pleasure when Lena approached us to see about uh, the opportunity to be a keynote here. And, and one of the things for me as an employee, I think I'm always looking for that validation that I personally, personally are, are doing the right things or that my company is doing the right thing. So, Thank you for that validation, and I hope all of you um, learned something from today. I'm going to digress for just a, a, a moment, because on uh, the weekend as I was preparing for my keynote, my son, who's uh, 10 years old, is getting ready for speech arts. Uh, remember speech arts in school, you had to prepare a speech and, and present it. Well, one of the things that I was always coached about was staying on time and not talking too fast. So let's see uh, how I do today. So uh, one of the things that uh, I, I get to see a lot of working for a global company is uh, a lot of statistics on what IBM is doing globally. And when I'm given the opportunity to present uh, in Canada, I always like to take some of those statistics back closer to home. So uh, two of the tiles that I'd like to spend a, a few moments on here that I think are very relevant to all of you is the tile in the middle there with the 600 internships or co-ops. Not many people um, have the opportunity to learn or understand that we take 600 plus students on an annual basis for internships and co-ops. So that's many of your students. Um, and many of your students are given the opportunity to work on projects, use our technology, and have very rich experiences as a result of their co-op or internships. One of the uh, things that we do at the end of that um, uh, internship or co-op, like we all do, is we survey people for their experiences. And often the students tell us that what was the most meaningful for them was being able to use today's technology to solve problems for our clients. So that's very rich and rewarding. And one of the recent things that we've been able to do for our interns um, 
is be able to provide them with a micro-credential so that when they leave their internship or their co-op, they actually can put something on their resume that they've worked at IBM and that they've achieved um, you know, a, a credential. And, and the interesting thing that many of my older colleagues have actually highlighted is that this generation are Olympic learners. You give them an opportunity to go and absorb new information, they'll go out and get 10 or 12 badges. And, and our badges, they take time and effort. There's, there's testing that's involved, there's minimum grade requirements, and uh, the students that we hire from your wonderful academic institutions, uh, we see that dedication and, and that passion. Um, the other one that I would just highlight is the $525 million of research that we do locally here in Canada. You may not be aware, but um, IBM has one of the largest corporate uh, labs. We have 12 labs globally, and uh, we have 3,000 researchers, professional researchers with their PhDs and lots of credentials. Um, and we really believe that the world is our lab to um, drive change and uh, bring tech for good is, is what we believe. Um, just a, a quick number there, uh, taking to the U.S., is that uh, we've led the U.S. patent uh, leadership for the last 27 years. We actually had 9,000 patents in 2019. And often, if you want to see what the future of technology is going to look like, you can look at our reports from research to actually see uh, what the next five years could look like from a technology standpoint. Um, so that's always exciting. There has been a recent one that uh, shows drones being delivered by, or sorry, coffee being delivered by drones. So I'm not sure where that one's going yet, but maybe in five years we'll know. So it's not new uh, news to any of us that the world is facing a serious talent problem or that skilled humans fuel the economy. But one of the challenges that we have, uh, and we, we kind of talked to it in, in the last question around the technical skills that are in high demand. Um, organizations are having challenges finding these technical skills. And I won't mix words with our uh, digital badging. It was all about technical skills. Uh, there was some conversation this morning at the table around does IBM offer badging around communication and soft skills. We may get there at some point, but most of our badges are in, in the technical space. So one of the things that we've seen um, as part of looking at addressing how we were going to be building out this talent and finding skills and helping our clients find the technical skills they needed to take advantage of our products was um, that we, we, we go out and we survey clients and they tell us that they're having a, a challenge. So we needed to find a way to help our clients find uh, skill sets um, that they could take benefit from. We also, uh, when we survey, we also surveyed IT recruiters. Now, how many of us really know that we're IT recruiters 20, 25 years ago? We maybe knew about Kelly Services, which was you know, one of the small recruitment firms. Now, there are a large number of IT recruitment firms. And I know just recently, 12 of my, or three, in the last 12 months, three of my colleagues have left IBM to actually go and work at recruiters um, to help organizations find skills. So when we talk about the changes that are taking place in the marketplace, it's not only in the skills, but it's the recruiting that companies need to go after and, and find those skills. So we believe that the digital badging will, will help with that. So um, in 2012, the Open uh, Standards uh, badges, badges Open Standards was established, and it was interesting. In 2014, uh, two years later, that's when IBM began our work exploring the use cases. And our primary use case, uh, I go back to the comment that I made around technical skills. It was about how we could get more people to use our software. So in the, um, the slide here, one of the things I just want to highlight is around uh, why technology is changing so quickly or how it's changing. And that's the relevancy of making sure that we can find those skills quickly. So if you look um, you know, on the, on the left-hand side there when it talks about technology change, let's just take a moment to think about our cell phone. Our cell phones have replaced cameras, 
flashlights, calculators, and it's pushing that technology down to the end user as a consumer. I would bet that all of us do way more on our mobile devices, personally, than what we do in our corporate jobs or our industry job. Eventually, there will be that shift where we will be asked as employers to do more in that environment by being consumers of that technology that's being pushed down to us. So the lines of business users are now having to improve their skills on technology. You're not just somebody working in the technology department that's using IT. You're actually now a consumer of, of that, and you need to build the skills to be able to use that technology. Um, another example there is just a police officer. Think of a police officer 10 years ago. You know, they maybe had their gun and a billy stick. Now an officer is armed with um, IoT cameras so that they can, um, you know, be filmed while they're on the job. They've got dashboards of analytics in their cars uh, with predictive analytics. So even a police officer is having to go through rigorous training how to use the technology that they're being enabled with. So if you were going to be a manufacturer of some of that technology, you may be interested in creating a badge so that you can demonstrate that the officers have actually achieved um, you know, the standards and the requirements to use that technology. And we've seen that in many of the colleges when they look at the robotics, the FANUC robotics and those types of things. That's where some of those credentials first started uh, was in the IT space. So everything has pointed to a need to change to look at how we develop skills and how we take inventory of our skills. So it required us to create these new credentials. Um, and like anything in IBM, before we embark on a new journey, we have to have a very good solid process and a solid structure. So we embarked on the journey to look at what that structure and what the requirements were uh, that the badges should achieve. So the first element was that the badges needed to be very timely. So our technology changes. So what if somebody took a badge two years ago, did they need to update it two years from now when that technology changed? So we needed to make sure we were very agile um, and that we could uh, issue and build the badges very quickly and then and keep them up to date, quite frankly. They also needed to be verifiable. This is, this is an interesting one. There's a lot of fraud in credentials. So how do we make sure that when somebody is investing the time to build these credentials out, that they're actually, as my kids would say, legit. <laughs> um, they also have to be portable. So there's a big discussion taking place in, in, um, in the industry around portable skills. And a great example is around analytics. Um, we have a lot of great tools to do analytics. But learning analytics in the healthcare space is a different than learning analytics in supply chain. So we have tools that teach analytics, but does that mean that they're portable? Somebody that's learned how to use these tools in healthcare, could they move over and use these same type of tools in a different industry? So being portable and being able to demonstrate that the skills that you gained um, actually could be moved uh, as you change careers. They also needed to be discoverable, and Kathleen talked about that um, earlier as well. Think of what we do now in social platforms. You know, Facebook was a social community and LinkedIn was supposed to be a professional community. There was actually an article written the other day about how LinkedIn is kind of turned into a bragging opportunity where you showcase all of your wonderful achievements and the learning that you've done and the great presentations that you did. And the question was around, is that really what LinkedIn was designed? Or is that where this evolution and this change is going to happen in this social space? And they also needed to be differentiating. Um, you know, I remember when I was in school, there were, you know, maybe I wouldn't admit it, but there were times when you got through the material to get to the end of the course, right? But you didn't necessarily remember some of that. And so with the credentials, uh, one of the founding um, objectives of our credentials were that you weren't going to be able to just to go through the credential and get your little stamp. You actually had to demonstrate and build a competency so that you would be able to show that proficiency in what you got. 
Otherwise, our credentials would be watered down and um, over time not be uh, as successfully viewed. So open badges seem to meet the criteria, all of our criteria. Uh, we could brand them, and at IBM that's always something very important is our branding. Uh, we could go through and look at the uh, specific skills and the tags that were assigned to those, those skills. Um, and so we adopted the open badges. And with anything, again, we needed to build a process. And um, whenever I see slides like this, it takes me back to my grade 10 computer science class when I learned computer flow mapping and I thought, when am I ever going to use this? Um, but it, it proves a purpose. And today, we offer a badge in business process mapping. That business process mapping is very similar to that computer science flowchart. So I won't share what's on this, this chart. Um, it'll be available to you. But it really uh, talks about the importance of the flow and the methodology. And I think the work that eCampus has done around the policies and the frameworks really sets a very strong foundation for those of you that are embarking on, on your journey. I'd like to, you know, those nine pilots that are out there, if you didn't have some of that foundation, it would be very different entering into that space without that foundation built. So we launched our pilot, and uh, we, we, we did it very, um, I don't want to say complex, but instead of going with one type of badge, we went with five types of badges. And the reason we did that was, uh, I talked a little bit earlier about the proficiency. So the skill, you know, were you just acquiring the skill or were you mastering the skill? Or in some cases, we actually had faculty that were contributing to some of our badges. So you could actually become a contributor. And then, you know, what would be the facets of, of being a contributor? So one of the other things that we had to do when we looked at the badging is we also had to create uh, the personas. And for those of you that have gone through design thinking, you know that persona really means the people that we're designing the experience for. And so when we were on this journey, uh, we actually came up with three personas of, of people that could be taking on um, the opportunity to earn a, a, an IBM badge. The first one is the badge earner the student. Uh, it could be an individual that was reskilling or upskilling, um, but they were going to be kind of classified as the badge earner. We had this middle group too, which was called the IBMer. Um, and for, for those of you that may not know, uh, we are challenged individually on a quarterly basis. So that's every three months, I have to make a commitment to get 40 hours worth of training in and over above my day job. And one of the things that many of us did is we did that because you, know, you were told to do it, so you did it and you knew it was a part of your job, but you never really got a way to show people that you were actually invested in doing that. And the badging now allows us to do that. The interesting thing with the badging that we've implemented too is um, it's kind of assessment based. So one of the things that you do is you go in to uh, take the badge with no understanding of the content. And they're actually assessing you where they think your understanding is. And the cool thing about it is, is if your knowledge is pretty far along, they don't make you do all of the training. It actually started to evolve and make it personalized. So if I knew 30% of the content based on the quiz and the test that I took, it didn't make me go back and do that 30%. So I know for those of us that, that did it, myself and our colleagues, you know, you kind of hit the button on the test and you think, okay, please, because I don't want to have to do another eight hours. <laughs> um, so I think that's where the personalized learning will come in over time on these assessments. If individuals are coming in uh, learning a specific skill and they already have some of that established, don't make them go back to the beginning. There was also the persona about our clients. So our clients, uh, you know, that make investments with IBM uh, to use our technology, one of the questions that they always had was, you've got great products, but am I going to be able to take advantage of them by finding the talent that's going to be able to, to use them? So we felt that it was important to look also at the persona of our clients. Uh, we also established objectives for the entire organization. So if we were to design these badges, 
you know, who are we going to design them for, and what were the objectives we were going to achieve. And in any pilot, we know that we have to measure the success of the pilot, and we felt that looking at those objectives were going to be key um, as we looked at uh, the success of the pilot. We also had to look at use cases. So by having the three personas, uh, we wanted to be able to make sure that we understood the use cases and the expected benefits. And I, I won't spend time, but you can see that there was a lot of effort put into uh, understanding these use cases and, and the outcomes. So we started with the pilot, and um, you know, we were kind of worried about how successful the pilot was gonna be because it seemed to be a huge undertaking. And the interesting thing was that the results exceeded our expectations, um, which is always very rewarding when you're embarking on something new that you want to convince your organization to keep funding um, because you know that funding drives new activities. Um, so we were, we were pleased with the, the results. We saw improvements in employee engagement, so I kind of talked about you know, myself personally interested in getting those badges. We saw that employees were um, you know, starting on their journey and they were actually finishing that journey. So they started uh, a course and you know, sometimes you abandon that course and you wanna get back to it, but you don't. Um, in this way, people were getting back to it even when they put a pause on their learning. Um, we also saw interesting pieces on, on product demonstrations. And we thought, how, how is that connecting to badging? What we found was that learners were going in, looking at the skills that they could build, understanding some of our products, going and downloading free trials, playing with the technology, and then going to their places of work and saying, I'm spending hours doing this spreadsheet. There actually could be a better way for us to do this. And here's the technology, and here's the learning that I've had. Could I start with a pilot? So that was an outcome. Um, that we, that we saw as well. And we saw a lot of activity on the social platforms. So what's the benefit of that to IBM? If there's a benefit to the, uh, to the earner or to the learner. You know, they could showcase the talents that they had uh, achieved. But there was also a marketing benefit. Think of how much it costs us to advertise. That was free advertising. You know, we helped the learners get their badges, get the IBM brand out there. And quite frankly, that's a challenge for IBM these days. When I was younger, there was the PC. Many of us are old enough maybe to know the PC that had the little IBM sticker. People knew who IBM was. Nowadays, the younger generation, they don't necessarily see IBM. They see Google and they see Amazon because they use Google Classrooms. Um, but IBM traditionally has not been a business con to consumer business. It's been business to business. So when we're talking to the younger generations about the skills that they need, they're, they're kind of saying, well, who is IBM? But they don't know until we spend the time with them, helping them understand actually the, the things that IBM powers from a, a, tech, a technology standpoint. I kind of say we're like that, um, the uh, genie in the Wizard of Oz behind the, the, behind the curtain. We let our clients celebrate a lot of our successes. We're not out in the forefront saying, look at IBM, this is what we've done. We let our clients tell us uh, how well we've done, but in a way that hurts us because people don't necessarily know what we've done. So we do believe that badges are transforming every area of our business. Uh, we've seen the benefits, uh, benefits across the earners, across our employees, across our clients, um, and we've, we've measured some of those, those impacts. And I think even since this slide has been put together, there's been continued impacts that we're not necessarily measuring uh, uh, the same. I think the disruption that's taking place in and around uh, skills is something that um, is, is very important to look at and, and to continue to understand where credentials are going to disrupt uh, you know, education and, and employers as they're looking for skills. I know Kathleen mentioned uh, Northeastern um, College, they were one of the early adopters of our badges. Um, they actually have badges as part of their course credit. Um, and we all know here locally that bringing new curriculum into your courses and, and achieving the key learning outcomes and the learning objectives takes a little bit of time. Um, so hopefully maybe that will change over time as there's more recognition that some of this change needs to be done more quickly. 
um, but uh, they've actually uh, started to be able to recognize students as part of the courses uh, for, for the credentials. One of the biggest compliments for us is when our competitors look to us for guidance around how they could implement uh, badging. And some people say to me, well, why would you work with your competitors? But the interesting thing is often some of our competitors are also our biggest partners. Um, you know, we work with organizations and to think that the organization is only gonna buy IBM uh, is not realistic. So by working with our partners and helping them uh, look at the credentials like Microsoft and like Cisco as an example, it provided a great opportunity for us to collaborate very much like you do um, within the academic space. Um, I kind of call it a co-optition uh, where we work together uh, in good faith. Um, also, you know, there's a great example. How many of you years ago saw the PMP stamp in somebody's email with the little trademark, right? There's an evolution there. They're now doing badges. So they had a little bit of a, you know, PMP certification trademark, but they've modernized and brought it in into a credential. So we are pleased to see that uh, we've made significant progress in the badging. Uh, it's always an honor to be recognized outside of, of, of your organization. The opportunity to present here today um, is wonderful and uh, we believe that we've laid some great groundwork on badging, but we do believe we've just kind of, tussed, you know, kind of tipped our toes. Uh, there's tremendous opportunity and, and we want to keep measuring that. And I, I'm, a, I'm a psychology major, so I always go back to the person. When I hear a story like Coletta's, um, that she was a, a mother, had been out of the workforce for a number of years, and was now looking at getting back into the workforce, and was having a challenge. People were looking at her resume and not thinking that she had been kept up to date. She actually enrolled, took some IBM micro-credentials, got those on her resume, and she started to get some hits on her resume. That's a very powerful story. So I'd like to actually meet Coletta and kind of shake her hand because I think that's always a challenge of how do you get back into the workforce after being out for a period of time. So congratulations to, to Coletta. So locally, we've had some great partnerships with our academic uh, institutions, both locally here in Ontario, um, as well as uh, with Alberta. One of the th driving forces in Alberta to look at this, uh, you know, kind of upskilling and reskilling is the oil and gas industry. There's been a lot of job loss and a lot of very, very skilled workers, but very unique sets of skills. So there's there's thought that if they're looking at, uh, you know, upskilling and reskilling, some of those skills are very transferable. Um, so by working with credentials, uh, those, those employees can get reskilled and uh, you know, get back into the workforce in a totally different industry. So thank you to our early adopters of uh, Mohawk, Seneca, Bow Valley, and SAIT. I remember some of those early conversations with those academic institutions. Um, you know, they had started to explore credentials, and when we walked in and said, we've got a micro-credential that we think would be of interest to you in blockchain, they said, blockchain, what's blockchain? So when they looked at the effort that would be required to build a curriculum and build a sandbox and a tool set that could help train students on blockchain, um, it was very attractive to be able to, to uh, work with us um, on, on providing the students those learning opportunities. So lessons learned, we always need to look at lessons learned as a part of our ongoing journey through learning. And uh, in IBM fashion, we came up with uh, 10 steps to uh, a successful high impact of a badge program. So um, you know, I'll, I'll let you read through some of these, but it's very key throughout the journey of your badge in program to start with the why, communicate, ensure there's the executive buy-in at your organization or at your academic institution, one of the challenges that I think many of us have is we all have great ideas, but if they're not supported by the right people, um, it's very challenging sometimes to get what I call that groundswell to help you take that good idea into um, the next stages. So what's next? 
Uh, we believe, and I've alluded to blockchain, if you don't know what blockchain is, it might be something to spend a little bit of time on. Um, we believe what blockchain can do in the future is what the internet did for all of us 15 years ago. Um, blockchain, we believe, has an opportunity to bring networks together. And there was a question earlier about who is the curator. Um, and one of the points of views is that there's a learning credential network that could be created, whereby a student owns the credentials that they have. Um, a, a little bit of a story to share. My niece uh, went to school to become a nurse. She graduated with her nursing diploma. She had to wait six weeks before she could write her exam because the process needed to be moved through for her to get evidence to the testing center so that she could write her exam. She had a job offer, but she needed to pass her test first before she could accept the job offer. In a learning credential network, all of that could be in what I call a digital wallet or a digital locker, where that student could have their credential, they could have their diploma, they could have their grades, they could have their references, they could have their police check, where all of that would need to be done in a very timely process. So I believe and we are of the thought that we're on the cusp of blockchain in this network and there's no better network than in higher education where we are transient and where we work and um, you know, students need to work their way through that process and sometimes it's not necessarily always an easy process. So thank you, hopefully um, that was uh, enlightening and that uh, if anything, maybe you took away those 10 steps um, to help you be successful on your uh, next journey. So open for questions. No questions, I'm gonna get off easy. <laughs> I'm curious, outside of the IBM um, badges that you offer, how does IBM view similar badges coming from other institutions? Sorry, how do we view? Badges coming, or micro-credentials, yeah. badges coming from other institutions that you yourselves did not issue. Very good question. So, um, IBM is innovative, often in the way we use our badges, but we necessarily haven't matured as quickly maybe on how we're gonna use those badges to our advantage in our hiring practices. So if I was the director of HR, um, I probably would, maybe don't quote me here, but um, would say we're on a journey to figure out how we use badging from other organizations to help us recruit talent. Um, so we're not there yet, but although we know this is where the industry is going to go, where we are using it internally is around uh, the opportunities for employees to move from one organization or one project to another um, with those skills that they've mastered. So we're much more mature looking at how we're using our own badges than how we're using uh, other organizations' badges. Hi. Um, Hi. With uh, IBM being a global uh, corporation, how are you, are you using badges um, to recruit people globally, or that that could be applied globally? Yeah, it, it's it's interesting. It's a good question because as a as a global company, one of the things that we even found when we were rolling out our badging program is the proficiency across the world is very different. So some of the um, understandings that you know, we think in North America are common throughout the world, in some of the developing countries, we actually had to take that to a, a I don't wanna say a lower level, but a more granular level because the base of those learners maybe was very different than we were here in North America. So we've actually had to take some of the badging and redesign it based on the geography as to where uh, learners reside. It was actually um, one of the, the beginning projects that we did in this badging space was in Africa, 
around looking at how we help their large population that is in a um, you know, very large portion of their population is that sweet spot where learning takes place. And so our CEO um, at the time, Ginny Rometty, actually invested a lot in the Africa Skills Program and uh, we've issued a lot of badges even in, in the country there because we believe it's an opportunity for them to move their economy forward as well. So there are definitely differences. So uh, first, let me compliment you. It's great work you're doing. Thank you. <laughs> um, I am also wondering about the piece of interoperability, right? So you talked about how you won the IMS award. Is your, the way you do, are doing it, is it product certified by IMS Global? Um, how are you ensuring interoperability so that you can do that partnering that you talked about with organizations like Cisco, et cetera, because otherwise it's kind of difficult to make sure they're all talking on the same highway. Yeah, there's, there's. Um, I'm not the expert on who's worked with, um, you know, some of those governing organizations, um, but one of the things that uh, we've always made sure as an IBM organization is that we work with the right, um, you know, kind of leading organizations to make sure that the methodologies and the practices that we're following are in line, um, you know, with some of those governing bodies. Um, if you want some more information on that, I'd be happy to reach out to David Lesser, who is kind of our spearhead uh, in IBM and our, our expert around how we've done a lot of that kind of as our groundbreaking. Uh, thank you very much for that presentation. Uh, my concern about this uh, uh, digital budget will be on the integrity side of things. How do you ensure uh, that whoever is getting the badge is actually the person that is uh, the badge being awarded to? That the individual that's taking the badge has <laughs> actually yeah. done the work? Yes. It's a good question. Trust. <laughs> um, you know, it, it's very interesting because when we first started to do some of the um, the uh, the testing in some of the classrooms, and it was you know at one of our early adopter institutions, and I was proctoring. I had never been a proctor. That was never on my resume. It was never something that I even knew I could do. Um, and I went to the institution and they said to me, okay, before you proctor, I need to spend 15 minutes with you and tell you how students cheat. <laughs> and I, I was flabbergasted at what, you know, were, were opportunities. So um, in the uh, situations with the badges that are proctored, uh, you know, there's a sign-in process and, you know, there's a bit of a rigor around that. So for the programs that we've got with the academic institutions, there is a little bit more of that rigor with the program of study and the student. Uh, so those ones are, uh, are definitely validated. Uh, maybe in the future, with the way technology is, it could be a retinal scan or a thumbprint, um, but we're not, we're not there today. There's lots of ways I think uh, we could do that authenticity, um, but policies and practices are preventing us from invoking some of those. <laughs> Hi, thank you so much for all of your comments so far. Um, I noticed that you use open badging and an open badging standard. Can you talk to us about why that was important to IBM? What uh, influenced your decision to make that choice? Anything that we can understand better about that? Yeah. I can just touch at that at a very high level um, because I wasn't on the committee that made the decision. <laughs> but um, typically when IBM is going to go out and, and adopt something, there's a lot of rigor around, is it actually going to help us meet the objectives? Um, often we will build things on our own um, and often there are things that we will go and look at others um, to be able to help us with. And I think when they looked at some of the uh, requirements and some of the objectives that we had. We didn't want to be in a position of reinventing the wheel on something. Um, so I think when the open badges was looked at and in the timing that we wanted to get started with, it kind of ticked a lot of, a lot of those boxes. Um, and that, that's something that when you're you know, looking at some of these programs, there's always technology 
behind some of these programs. And you know, how you build your framework and how do you build the infrastructure and the architecture to be able to do that. It's, it's quite a big undertaking. So sometimes when you can uh, benefit from some of that work that what others have done to help you get there a little bit faster, I think that could be part of it. Um, but David may have a, a, you know, a bigger checklist than my, my high-level checklist. Yeah. Please join me in thanking Carrie Morano for her great... Wait, 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 wait. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, this is your chance to go and talk to each other about all of the things you're wondering and all of the big questions you have. We've got a 30-minute networking break. There's coffee, tea, and we'll come back here for our third keynote. Thanks. Uh, I'm Michelle Singh. I'm the Chief Technology Officer at eCampus Ontario, and I'm happy to present you your third keynote speaker for today. So I'm pleased to introduce... Anne-Marie Fannin. Anne is Director of Professional Development Program at the University of Waterloo. In this work, she oversees the development and delivery of curriculum that supports students in work-integrated learning opportunities, including the well-known Waterloo EDGE program. Through her work at Waterloo, Anne has also, also supports the university's lifelong learning initiatives, including its exploration with micro-credentials. She is engaged in the CE Whale community and has a clear and intentional goal of sharing with others how post-secondary institution can better engage and innovate with students through workforce-driven initiatives. Please join me in welcoming Anne. Well, thanks so much, Michelle. Um, I'd like to say thanks to eCampus Ontario for the invitation to speak and to share a little bit about what we're up to at the University of Waterloo. Similarly, I'm very excited to see your presentations this afternoon and to learn more about the great work that's underway across our province. So as you heard in the introduction, and as you might guess from the title of my presentation, I am a huge fan of work integrated learning and the impact that it can have on our post-secondary institutions, our community and industry partners, and of course, on our students. I also happen to think that as we in the post-secondary sector start to explore the role of micro-credentials in traditional education, that will programs provide us with a unique and well-established foundation for competency-based micro-credentials. So for the next 30 minutes or so, we're going to dive into the hot topic of skills, exploring how will programs can be structured to both equip our students with the skills that industry needs today, while simultaneously assisting them in developing critical competencies that will be necessary for navigating a rapidly changing future of work. And then to wrap it all up, we'll explore the role of micro-credentials in assessing and evidencing skill development through will. Sound good? So many of you will know that the University of Waterloo was the first post-secondary institution to introduce the co-op model of education in Canada. And while it came under sharp criticism at the time, the institution itself was founded with the notion that students can and should deepen their skills and enhance their employability by engaging with industry as an essential component of their degree. Today, whether through our long-standing co-op program or our newly introduced EDGE program, every single undergraduate student at the University of Waterloo can complete work integrated learning as a part of their degree program. And if you aren't familiar with what that looks like, every single student will complete multiple work-based work integrated learning experiences. For our co-op students, that means at least four four-month paid work terms. It's also important to know that it's not a placement process, it's a competitive job process. Students compete for jobs, and oftentimes employers compete for students. Another interesting note is that it is a centralized job program, and so what that means is that almost every student can apply for almost every job. It's up to the student to know their skills and to be able to market them to the employer, regardless of their academic discipline. The centralized nature of our co-op program is not unique. You will find other centralized programs across Canada. 
What is unique about the size of our what is unique about our program though is of course its size. Uh, so last year we supported students in completing close to 22,000 paid work terms, working with over 7,000 employers in more than 60 different countries. What that means is we do run the world's largest co-op program, and we're really proud of those numbers, but we're even more proud of the impact of the program and that we have been able to scale work-integrated learning while still maintaining quality and achieving intended outcomes. So later on in the presentation, we'll take a look at some of the rich and broad skill development that can occur through participation in work integrated learning. For now, I just wanted to share a couple of the high level success indicators that we look at with uh, respect to our co-op program. So first of all, we want to make sure that students get jobs. And last year, 97.6% of our students were employed. We also want to make sure that they do a good job in those jobs. Each student receives an end of term evaluation from their employer. 95% of co-op students last year received an overall evaluation with a rating ranging from very good to outstanding. We also talked about um, income and students needing income to support the pursuit of their post-secondary education. Co-op is a paid form of work integrated learning. Last year, students at the University of Waterloo earned $285 million with an average earnings per co-op work term of $12,400. We see that economic impact continue after graduation as well. So when we look at some Ontario University graduate survey data, we see some really interesting outcomes from participation in a co-op program. 82% of Waterloo graduates were earning $50,000 two years after graduation. That compares to 45% of Ontario graduates across the province. And another interesting metric is with respect to skills and alignment of skills with employment. So six months after graduation, 96% of co-op students indicated that they were working in a job that related to the skills they developed at Waterloo. That compares to 79% of students across the province. And when we get into the ways in which we talk and think about skill development through co-op, that might help to illuminate that statistic. On the industry and economic impact side, we also see some pretty remarkable gains for participation in work integrated learning. Last year, Deloitte completed an economic impact study of the University of Waterloo and calculated the economic contribution of Waterloo's co-op program alone at $410 million towards Ontario's GDP. Noting that the program led to the creation of over 4,000 full-time jobs, that is separate from the co-op work terms themselves. And in a recent study done by the colleagues at the Center for the Advancement of Cooperative Education, which is our research center on work integrated learning, when asked specifically about the return on investment for hiring, training, and supervising their most recent co-op student, 93% of employers reported a positive ROI, with 79% of them saying they got more or much more from their student than they put in, and another 81% of them saying they would offer that student a full-time position should one become available. So those are some really powerful reasons for supporting work integrated learning, some really compelling data. Uh, but to be frank, those are the traditional reasons for engaging in work integrated learning. Those are the exact reasons that industry leaders found, um, partnered with the founders of the University of Waterloo in 1957 to establish co-op. Uh, but the question that myself and my colleagues at the University of Waterloo have been asking lately is, what are the skills and competencies that our students are gonna to need to navigate a rapidly changing future of work? And what are the ways in which work integrated learning programs can equip students with those skills? So we've already talked about this a bit today, I won't belabor it, um, but just to really quickly review some of the conditions that are going to be affecting our graduates and the generations to follow. Of course, we have globalization and climate change, rapid technological advancements, most notably the impacts of AI and automation. 
uh, we see demographic, demographic shifts, so both um, an increase in the aging population here, but then also an increase in lifespan um, that's really changing the ways in which we think about um, work and longevity of careers. We see, of course, an increase in social and economic divides, most um, notably reflected in the hollowing out of the labor market, and an increase in precarious employment uh, seen in a variety of different ways, but um, notably with the increase of the gig economy. So all of those factors are coalescing to create a future of work for our students that will be at its core about the ability to navigate change. So those graduates for both economic and lifespan reasons are expected to work into their 70s or even their 80s. And those longer careers paired with the rapid change impacts of AI and automation give those graduates an imperative to be lifelong learners constantly upskilling and reskilling. I'm gonna push a bit on the notion of the T-shaped professional that we talked about earlier uh, and, and loop back to Kathleen's icicles because we're starting to think about this less as a T-shaped professional and more about the notion of a comb-shaped professional where we will need to develop rich expertise either consecutively or concurrently in a number of different areas but always buttressed by those ever critical human skills which are of course expected to increase in importance as tasks which can easily be codified are likely to be automated. And the increase in the gig economy and precarious employment means that many of our graduates will have to navigate a portfolio career where they're weaving together a livelihood through short-term contracts um, and project work. So we've been spending a lot of time at the University of Waterloo thinking about these factors, considering how we might need to adjust our curriculum accordingly. Uh, we've done a comprehensive review of existing competency frameworks, and we've talked to a lot of our stakeholders, including close to 1,000 of our employers, to create what we're calling our future-ready talent framework. Now, for the sake of time, I will not go into the methodology that we use to create the framework, but if you're interested in learning more, I would direct you to our Wattcase website, where you can find information on the methodology and validation process in the framework. So dun, 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 here it is. At the University of Waterloo, we define future ready talent as the ability to expand and transfer expertise, to develop self, to build relationships, and to design and to deliver solutions. So under that expand and transfer expertise category, we have the the, the long part of the T, the icicle, the ability to develop context and discipline-specific skills, both seen through a student's degree program, but then also in their work experiences. As Carrie mentioned earlier, we've added technological agility as a key competency for our graduates, along with information and data literacy. The ability to develop oneself has always been critical for success in the workplace, but we do see an increased need for this as we exist in a world that will be underpinned with a need for lifelong learning. So we've identified the core competencies of self-assessment, self-management, lifelong learning, and career development. Human skills, we've already talked about the importance of human skills, building relationships, working effectively with others, have always been core competencies. We wanted to reflect the increasingly diverse and globalized world in which our students will be working. And so we've identified competencies of collaboration, communication, and intercultural effectiveness. And last but not least, we still need to be able to do. We need to be able to take that knowledge and to actually create and implement solutions. So we've identified the core skills of critical thinking and innovation mindset and implementation. And it's our contention that when structured properly, work integrated learning programs can assist students in developing every single one of these future ready talents. Uh, now, as I started things off, I am a huge fan of work integrated learning, but there are a few structural elements that need to be in place if you're looking to achieve these specific outcomes. First of all, the students have to have work-based work integrated learning experiences, preferably more than one. And there also has to be a modicum of flexibility in the program to allow students for career exploration. So really quickly, I'd like to share some of the ways in which we see students developing these competencies in our existing programs that will also hopefully help uh, illuminate the need for those structures. 
So human skills. We've talked about the importance of human skills a fair bit. I don't purport that work integrated learning programs have a monopoly on the development of human skills. Not at all. But the reality is that we do leverage human skills differently in the workplace than we do in the classroom. And we try to bridge the divide by giving students more project work, teamwork, and those are very, very valuable learning experiences for our students, but they can't fully replicate the contextual differences that come into play once you add in the influences of power and hierarchy, of workplace politics, organizational culture, and of trying to integrate into a long-standing and sometimes quite dysfunctional work team. And so work integrated learning programs allow our students to see the ways in which human skills are leveraged in a workplace context before they graduate. And we believe so strongly in the importance of Will supporting human skill development that we have an entire program known as WAPD, which is a series of online courses focused on the development of human workplace skills in which students complete while they're out on their work terms. The idea being that when we pair curriculum curriculum with workplace experience, we can amplify the development of those skills. Next up, we have the skill of transfer. So the ability to take your knowledge and skills and apply it in new and varied contexts. And this is one skill where I will argue that work integrated learning programs, particularly work integrated learning programs with multiple work experiences, absolutely excel. So if you think about the idea of a co-op student, they have four months to figure out the organizational culture in which they are working, to determine what skills and knowledge they have to support that organization in meeting their aims, to build the relationships, and to develop the work product that will help that company succeed. And sometimes that transfer is close. So sometimes we see a student that's working very close in a position that's very close to their academic program. But if you remember at the beginning of the presentation, I told you that we have a centralized program. And what we're learning is that students are using that centralized program to do some real rich and deep career exploration and to work in different industries. So in a sample of 5,000 recent co-op graduates, 88% of them had worked for three or more companies and 68% of them had worked in three or more industries. So when you think about that, they are learning how to take their knowledge and skills and very quickly, very rapidly apply them in different contexts as a matter of course. And if you remember the student evaluations that I told you about at the beginning of the presentation, they're doing so to high levels of success. In addition to developing the skill of transfer, our students are also developing comfort with transition. Now, I thought I was going to be able to read this to you, but... I don't have my glasses, so I might need to, uh, let's see what I can do here. I don't know. I can project. Can you hear me? Oh, live stream. I can't. Okay. Oh, I have a printout. Look at me. I'm so resilient and adaptable. Okay, here we go. Initially, my options seemed too vague and open without clear direction. It's hard to sort through as a young person with so little exposure to the working world. As I am going through university and work placements, I'm increasingly excited to push myself and develop my skills, not to market myself for a specific role, but to market myself as a valuable addition to a team. I've been encouraged that I can be more fluid between roles and jobs than I initially thought. I don't have to stick to one career my whole life. It's kind of cool to see that changing things up every once in a while is becoming increasingly common. So this is a quote from Amani. She's a third year arts and business student at the University of Waterloo. And I happened to be involved in a mentorship program with her. And we were exchanging emails when I was putting together this presentation. She shared that thought with me. And it just so beautifully articulated that comfort with transition that I asked her if I could share with you and she kindly agreed. So I have no doubt that Amani is going to be equipped with the skills that she needs to successfully navigate that rapidly changing future of work. Really quickly, a couple of the other skills that we see our students develop through participation in Will. Career management. So the average co-op student at Waterloo is gonna have between 20 and 30 interviews by the time they graduate. 
every single one of those interviews an opportunity to reflect on their skills and to market them to employers. They also have those multiple work experiences where they get an opportunity to try out different organizations, different roles, different industries, and to find the types of positions in which they will thrive. Innovation and entrepreneurship also bubbles up regularly with respect to work integrated learning. There's some nascent research being done uh, in the international well community investigating connections between work integrated learning and the development of an entrepreneurial mindset. Certainly anecdotally is something that we see and hear from students all the time. You know, sometimes they'll be out and they will have multiple work terms in different organizations and they'll see a common problem across those organizations. And they realize that there is a real need for the product or the service that they would like to create. Sometimes it's only after multiple work terms that they realize that they really do want to strike out on their own and build their own company. And the benefit of them discovering this entrepreneurial mindset while they're still with us is that then we can support them in the creation of that venture. So at Waterloo, we have a program known as e-co-op, where students can take one or two of their work terms and dedicate them to the creation of their venture. Last but not least, lifelong learning. So this is something we talk about a lot, but how do we know how to actually create the habits of mind that our students will need to be lifelong learners? Again, I'll refer to some research done by our colleagues at the Center for the Advancement of Cooperative Education. We have seen that students are indeed developing a lifelong learning mindset as they progress through their co-op work terms. And I attribute it to a couple of things. Number one, there is something that is quite frankly jarring about being pulled out of the comfort of the classroom, put into a workplace, and realizing at a very young age that there is not a direct match between your skills and that organization's needs. That really instills in the student a need to be continuously learning and, and uh, developing. Secondly, every single work integrated learning program is going to have a reflective component in it. As human beings, we don't necessarily love to reflect. We have a bias towards action. But there is empirical evidence to suggest that reflection is very effective in developing self-efficacy and an internal locus of control, both of which are critical elements of a lifelong learning mindset. So what does all of this have to do with micro-credentials? Well, certainly at the University of Waterloo, it's our plan to assess students on the development of every single one of their future-ready talents uh, and to find ways of surfacing and making visible that learning. Uh, micro-credentials might just be the ticket. We certainly see the value in, as Kathleen said earlier, unlocking the degree and providing both students and employers with some additional evidence as to the skills and competencies that our students developed while they're with us. And when it comes to work integrated learning problem programs, we have well established mechanisms in place for this assessment. We have student self assessment as seen through the interview resume process and with reflections. We have institution-led assessment as seen through the curriculum uh, in the professional development program that my team runs. And then we have authentic work-based assessments of students completed by the employers while they're in the workplace. So in addition to that overall evaluation that I told you about, employers assess students on the development of 16 specific competencies while they're in the workplace. So I can't think of a more rigorous combination that would allow us to verify that students really have developed these skills than the self-institution and employer-led assessments that already exist in WILL programs. So that was certainly the question that we asked at the University of Waterloo for our eCampus pilot project. It's also a plug for you to come back and hang out with me at 1235 in this room to learn more about that. Um, broadly speaking, let's take a quick look at what that might look like. So we could imagine a world where students would earn a micro-credential before they go out on their first work term, indicating that they are indeed ready for the world of work. Then along the way, as they have their will experiences, we imagine students collecting evidence to support them in earning future-ready micro-credentials. As our employers continue to develop badges and to get into that space, of course, we want them to be earning those industry-specific badges as well, all along being supported with the rich, discipline-specific knowledge that they gain in their courses. 
There could be a place or a space for a career readiness certificate right before the student graduates. And then, of course, they continue on their lifelong learning journey, earning badges, diplomas, and other micro-credentials, hopefully re-engaging with our institutions along the way. Uh, really quickly, some of the challenges in skill assessment with work integrated learning. Uh, one of the biggest challenges in skill assessment has to do with the variability of the will experiences, especially when the student's in an employment context. It's not a classroom, and you can't prescribe the learning outcomes. Further, each student comes into the workplace with varying levels of readiness and various levels of willingness to engage. And then, of course, students like all of us suffer from some challenges with respect to self-assessment. Similarly, institutions are at varying levels of readiness to accept our students, to bring them into the workplace, and to support them purposefully in skill development. We have a question about defining career-ready benchmarks. So what is the career-ready benchmark? And then how do we administer that across a program with 22,000 students and 7,000 employers? Uh, and there's a couple of questions about the will supervisor as assessor. So first of all, you have to remember that the student is only there for four months. It makes it very difficult to be able to provide that student with some tangible, actionable feedback. And the other piece is that oftentimes an organization will assign a co-op student to an employee as their first attempt at supervision. So we also have occasionally very junior supervisors um, guiding our students. So that raises the question of what kinds of resources or supports might we need to put in place to um, support our supervisors in assessing our students. And the last piece is interesting, it's already come up today. So there's always these questions of trust and endorsement when we talk about micro-credentials, particularly when we get into this idea of kind of an institution and employer co-created credential. So are employers willing to assess and endorse our students and to make that public? And then are they willing to consume one another's endorsements of our students? The one last thing that I wanted to show you, and I apologize because you will not be able to see it at the back, but if we can figure out this piece of endorsement, I think there's something really, really exciting here. So this is what's known as the work term record. As a hiring manager, this is the first thing that I see when I um, am going to hire students into our program. Uh, what it basically lists is the previous work terms that the student has had, their employers, their job title, and that overall evaluation. So in my department, we've hired more than 400 co-op students, and I can tell you that this is the best, most reliable piece of information that I've ever seen as to which students I want to bring into my organization. Because just that single word, just that overall evaluation says to me that the student has in previous work terms demonstrated the capabilities, the ability to learn, to transfer their knowledge successfully in previous workplaces. So we pair that work term record with a 20 minute interview. I can tell you the names of the five co-op students that didn't meet or exceed our expectations. It is truly remarkable. And, and from the first day that I saw it, I wanted to figure out how we could replicate this more broadly? How can we take this rich information and use it as hiring managers with full-time employees? I do think we have to answer those questions of endorsement, um, of trust, of willingness to put this information outside of the system. Right now, our employers endorse our students, but are they willing to do so publicly? And again, are they willing to accept one another's endorsements? Those are some of the very exciting questions that we're going to ask and try to answer at the University of Waterloo in the years and months ahead. It's one of the many reasons that I love my job and that I think it's a really exciting time for us to be in the post-secondary sector. So thanks for your time today. And now I'll see if there's any questions. Marie, this is fantastic. Thank you. I just got so excited hearing about all this. But on this last slide, um, it, you don't have specific skill sets, right? So to the to the machine readability right. of specific skill sets going into those search, you know, the search terms. What what uh, how, 
you say that this is a great proxy for hiring them for anything. Mm -hmm. Could you speak about how you think about how you get specific skills into this mix? Yeah, beautiful. That's a great question and definitely where we're thinking about going, particularly with respect to our Future Eddy talent framework. Because we know that this works, but we also have to consider that this works in the context where I'm, I'm bringing a student into a position that's been created for a student for a four-month time period. Um, and so this may be for co-op hiring actually all that I need. But what we want to do is to give the students and the employers more evidence of the breadth of skills that the students have earned while they were completing their will programs so that when they go to look for that post-graduation job, they will exactly be machine readable, verified, um, ideally employer endorsed as well. Thank you. There's another question over here. Hi. I think that I loved your question at the end. Will others consume the badges we offer? Because I think it does two things. It speaks to the question that we all have when we talk about 700,000 badges being created. Will others make use of them? And I'm wondering if it comes down to a couple things. When we think about feedback, I trust someone's feedback when it's specific, when it's credible, so they have exposure to rating it. So that person who has a co-op term, you know they had exposure to rating it or they have that experience too. The specificity is interesting because that just came up in that question. And I'm wondering if we could break down thinking through a feedback-based model, which has lots of research as to why we may or may not trust each other's endorsements. And I think, so I'm wondering in the question of this is what are you bumping up against when you, someone says, I'm not gonna trust this? Because if somebody doesn't trust the badge, it's like a banking system where I won't gonna trust your money. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, that's a really, really good question. I would say right now with the co-op work term, we actually rarely come across questions of trust um, and, a, and a lack of willingness to publicly endorse. So um, every once in a while we hear from an employer who says, my legal team says I can't, I can't give you an evaluation um, because I'd be liable for the student's future performance. It, but it's very rare. Maybe one employer a year might say that. Um, and right now it's kind of contained within this system of co-op hiring. And so the questions from our perspective are, uh, once you move outside of that system, will people be willing to make that public endorsement? And then will they consume those endorsements as credible and valid? Right now, it, it really does work beautifully, which is why I'm, I'm so excited about the potential of it. Any other questions? Okay, well, thank you so much for your time. So those were three great keynotes. Um, I think we sense some common threads emerging. And to help us advance the conversation, I'm happy to welcome to the stage Chris McGrath, VP of Student Services at George Brown College. Chris brings over 18 years of leadership in student affairs and student services with him. At George Brown, he cultivates a campus environment that promotes lifelong learning as students prepare for their futures. Chris has this uncanny ability to connect the dots and ask thought-provoking questions. So without further ado, I'm pleased to turn the mic over to Chris for our morning call to action. It's okay, I'm a, I'm a Waterloo alum, I'm good with this slide. Yes. Ooh, that's a whole lot of face. I might go back to the Waterloo slide. <laughs> thank you so much. Um, yeah, there's a lot more gray there. Anyway, or here. Anyway, uh, thank you so much uh, to the folks from eCampus for the lovely introduction as well as for the opportunity to um, have 10 minutes of airtime after which there's no questions because the only thing standing between you and lunch is the thoughts in my brain. 
Um, and as I thought about uh, the call to action, I wondered, well, what exactly is it? Because I have this idea of a Carol Burnett Tarzan call in my mind, which might not go well over microphone. Um, and then I think about maybe I just say what they said and lead the charge to lunch. But um, in the intro, I... Uh, my brain turns at a pretty rapid speed on a good day, even on a Friday morning. And there's so much that has come up in my mind over the past few hours that we've been together with particular reference to our three wonderful uh, keynotes. And I want to thank the three of you for sharing uh, what, what you did with us already today. Um, but as I think about microcertification, what that means for the world that I work in, and as Vice President of Student Success at George Brown, I really am broadly concerned with the quality of the student experience across every domain at our institution, at our organization. And as I think about what microcertification is and what it represents, um, for me, in many ways, it represents a way to challenge the construct of how we as post-secondary institutions have traditionally structured, taught, assessed, and worked with knowledge and learning. And I come at that also not only from the work that I do, but also in my doctoral work where I, the focus of my inquiry is on reconciling disparate discourses on quality. And I spent a lot of my time looking at language and thinking about words and contemplating the types of language that surfaces in conversations around success and outcomes and how that actually renders real in many ways the reproduction of some pretty neoliberal and corporatized ways of being in our institutions. And I think that we have to problematize that. We have to critique that. We have to think about that. Um, and the discourse on microcertification has in many ways, even though we're still talking about an object of uh, a representation of learning and quality and success, it has forced us and ought to force us to step back from what we currently offer and think differently about to whom we're offering it. Kathleen spoke beautifully about our role as higher education in the emerging skills-based economy. And I really enjoy the phrase, the new majority of learners. And I, I, I will probably take that with me and get it emblazoned on a t-shirt um, because for me it truly encapsulates a way to talk about our learners um, that is real and that isn't necessarily predicated by an adjective that is about their identity and who they are in the world relative to who we are in the world. And I also really appreciated, Kathleen, what you said about us having to unlock degrees. And I asked myself, what, is, what does really unlocking mean? What does that look like? How do we interrupt the cycle of credential reproduction in our systems that truly has maintained a very stable and dominant paradigm of privilege with regards to access to post-secondary education? We see this manifesting in diverse ways across the country. Ontario, by our own admission, we have not been good at mobility. We have not been good at transfer in the ways that other jurisdictions have. And some of that is a byproduct of how our legislation has embedded and bifurcated a very clear wall of division between colleges and universities. And I think the discourse on microcertification is forcing us to really question what do we have on offer, who's offering it, and why are we competing with each other in doing so. But in unlocking our degrees and unlocking our credentials, we have to think about not just the object, but how do we in fact decolonize and deconstruct the traditional and very hegemonic ways of how we've structured teaching and learning at our institutions. We cannot ignore the very lovely land acknowledgement that started our day together. We cannot ignore what's happening along our rail lines across this country. We cannot ignore that we can't have a conversation about access to education without reconciling the very core relationship that we have as a country, and that is the relationship we have with our indigenous people. And so we have to decolonize our thinking and our practice around how we teach, what learning looks like, and how we generate knowledge. And is microcertification a way to open up that space, to bring in alternate and different ways of knowing and learning, and giving them 
credit and giving them validity and giving them that little check mark of certification that someone could put on a LinkedIn profile in order to access in a very necessary way the world of employment that they need to be into in order to survive. So a lot of this stuff makes me think about my own students at George Brown, our students here in Toronto. And for those of you who aren't familiar with George Brown College, we are one of the largest colleges in the country. Um, we vacillate in that claim between a couple of our other partner institutions here in the province. But we have over, just over 33,000 individual learners. And when I think about those 33,000 people, 60% are not coming directly from high school, and 50% of our learners already have post-secondary education experience. 28% of our learners enter this country on a study permit. But 80% of our learners were either born outside of Canada or have at least one parent who was. And that truly challenges our understanding and our construct of who is an international student and what internationalization and global mobility means. 29% of our students live in the city, city of Toronto's neighborhood improvement areas. And these are areas of our wonderful city that are sadly underserved by social services, infrastructure, transit, and democratic participation. And 70% of our students come from families where household income is less than $50,000 per year. And while we think about Anne Marie's earlier comment about the earning potential of the Will grad, the co-op grad, I know when I graduated from Waterloo, it wasn't 50 grand, I'll tell you that much. But um, 50 grand as a household family income in the city of Toronto where the average rent is in excess of $2,000 is really troubling. 70% of our students identify as non-white. 13% of our students have self-identified as having a disability. More than ever are reporting mental illness. And approximately 70% of George Brown students receive provincial financial aid, and more than 90% of our students work part-time to supplement what the government is already giving them. So we now have a new majority of learners. Yet the ways in which we teach, and the ways that we credential, and the ways that we verify by visa, give that little check mark, are still very much entrenched in reproducing structures and powers of privilege. And that, for me, is one of the things that we really have to contemplate if we're opening up the conversation around certifications, if we're widening the discussion around how micro-certifications can, in fact, be tools of access and tools of opportunity to education. And so it really does, for me, underpin what is, in many ways, what you described as the, being the imperatives for their learner revolution. And I think that we all need to really reflect on that. At the same time, I've, I've thought about, well, really, who curates this knowledge? The conversation around curation I thought was fascinating. And as a, a, not only a, a doctoral student, but also a student who got my undergraduate degree in French language, I'm a word nerd. And the first thing I did is you all were debating who curates what as I looked it up. And in fact, we have curators as owners and keepers of knowledge and keepers of skills. And I think I would agree with you, those are our learners. And we also have curators who are stewards and guardians and custodians, and I believe that those are our faculty. But I think more importantly, they're broadly our educators. Because when we talk strictly around learner and faculty, we also neglect to recognize the 90 plus percent of learning that happens outside of the classroom in co-curricular spaces, in extracurricular spaces. Work integrated learning is great. I am a product of that system. My co-op degree taught me all the things I did not want to do in my career. It truly did, and I proudly wear that. I proudly wear that. My extracurricular experience gave me a sense of calling in my life. And I don't have a badge to prove it. I don't have a work term record that has validated that. I don't have a notation on my transcript that shows the extent of my involvement outside of the classroom. But without any of those experiences which were enriching contexts through which I developed and honed the broadest set of human skills before any of us were even talking about them, neglects any form of recognition. And as the VP of Student Success, I have to think about that. And how do we create space for that broadest population, the new majority of students, of learners, who may not, because of financial or other reasons, have access to the resources to take on a work term at a charge, or work integrated learning experience at a charge, but who are, who are already busting their butts 15 hours a week working part-time at McDonald's, 
five hours a week volunteering in their church community, and 10 hours a week on campus as a career peer coach? How are we creating pathways of recognition and skill development and reflection and opportunity for them to weave together those experiences and verify and validate as work integrated learning or experiential learning in its broadest sense? And so I think the discussion on microcertification, we are just the tiniest wedge in the door, particularly if we are talking about this in terms of what this means for access and what this means for opportunity. And so in terms of a Carol Burnett moment, I'm not going to Tarzan scream into the microphone, but some things that I think are worth thinking about going forward into the afternoon before you then next get to hear me have a call of action. That's where I'm really going to tell you what I think. No, I'm kidding. Um, <clears throat> is in the afternoon, we have to think about post-secondary education is preparing students, and we're preparing ourselves by broadly engaging in setting up and structuring another way of certifying the work that we do and the, the learning that students do. How do we think about that in a way that is transcriptable, that's transferable? We saw from the example within IBM how that's, how that's moving within that closed system. But Anne asked the question, how do we see the work that students are doing being verified and trusted by others? And so we have to then, I think, engage our colleagues who are registrars in the room, and I see some of you, who are working feverishly in and among themselves on a global level to create a student data ecosystem that truly engenders an ethos of data portability and facilitates mobility and not just within and across institutions, but we have to transcend the idea of institutions, but student mobility from college to career. And I worry sometimes that we're still having conversations around micro-credentials and portability and transcriptability and records, et cetera, in isolation. I know that's the case at my own institution. I know that to be a fact. We're by no means perfect, but we all have to strive to do better to coordinate. And so as you head into this afternoon, as we head in, in, into our next set of time together, some of the things that I would like you to ask yourselves, and I'm going to be asking myself, as we see shining examples of initiatives and pilots and projects, which swiftly we can have a bias to action and want to replicate in a very mimetic kind of way, we have to ask ourselves, uh, what are we holding on to and why are we holding on to it? We have to ask ourselves, what are we developing and in whose ultimate best interest? And we have to think about who's not represented in what we're doing and why they're not there. And, and I don't disagree with the earlier question about problematizing the focus on employment. I really don't. I, and I, my heart tells me that the love of learning ought to be enough to create spaces for students to really develop the types of skills that they need. But I don't think necessarily a focus on employment is, is dehumanizing in any way. I think it actually is required. Because our new majority of learners simply need to access, as troubling as it is for me, the capitalist machine of society in order to survive. And they're looking at post-secondary education, particularly in my context in the college space, as the pathway to employment that's going to, in fact, help them earn the money that they need in order to help their families and communities grow and thrive. And so I invite you to think about those questions and perhaps come up with some answers for yourself and have a great lunch and we'll talk more this afternoon. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. I know Chris mentioned that you'd be able to run off to lunch. Um, <laughs> But before we break for lunch, um, I'd like to welcome David Porter, former CEO of eCampus Ontario, who would like to make an announcement. David. Thanks, Jamie. Thanks, Jamie. And uh, thanks to the keynoters this morning, Kathleen, Carrie, and uh, Anne-Marie for their uh, great words. I am keep pushing here, Lena. Uh, okay, uh, one of the things that uh, Humber College does is uh, publish a journal 
of uh, innovation in polytechnic education. And we thought that for our fall issue that we would announce today, uh, a theme issue on innovation and microcertification. And we'd like to invite colleagues in the room uh, to consider submissions to the journal uh, by the end of April uh, of 2020 for publication in the fall. Um, the type may be a little small for you to read. I'll put it up on the Twitter stream. But I think what we're learning and what we heard and from Chris's summation of the morning uh, is we need to think more expansively about microcertification and the role of certification in the ecosystem that is the world we live in and really begin to bring some rigor to the, uh, the problem as well. And so this is an opportunity for people who are doing extremely innovative work, asking hard questions uh, to propose uh, papers and studies that begin to illuminate some of these issues for colleagues around the province and across the country. And although it's the Journal of Innovation and Polytechnic Education, we invite our colleagues in the university sector to join us also. And also the people on the stream this morning as well who may be watching from across the country. So it is actually me who is the gate to your lunch. And I will now give you leave to enjoy a delicious lunch at the back. Thanks. <laughs>